Well, super excited to be here. I'm uh, Megan Clemen from the Filecoin Foundation. And I am Alan Ransel, uh, the founder, I guess, of Filecoin Green, part of yep. Protocol Labs. And uh, advisor to the Filecoin Foundation, and he leads the sustainability initiatives for the Filecoin Network. Uh, and I'm super excited to do a little fireside chat dash deep interrogation uh, about everything that Alan has been doing and all of the ways that we can take these tools and apply them to other projects to make all of our technology more green. Me, but not just me. The, the whole Filecoin Green team and a huge amount of support from the Filecoin Foundation. Lies. J just him by himself <laughs> in a cold, dark room. <laughs> okay, let's start off with, can you tell us a little bit about how, uh, tell us a little bit about energy usage of the Filecoin network and how yeah. it compares to other networks. Yeah, absolutely. So in 2021, um, the network had launched only a few months before, and it was growing really, really fast. Um, so the, the network now is more than 10 exabytes. Um, so it's between 5 and 10% the data storage capacity of all of Amazon Web Services, to give you a sense of, of like the scale of Filecoin. And so it's really, really big. And in early 2021, um, it had been up for a couple of months, was growing. We wanted to answer these questions around environmental impact and energy use. And so what we started out by doing was just looking at the protocol itself and what can the protocol itself tell us about the energy use of storing data on Filecoin. And so there are these two different components to storing data. You have to set up these zero knowledge proofs, which let you prove that you're storing data for, for clients. Um, and those zero knowledge proofs take energy to set up. That's sort of the core of the Filecoin network. You, you pay someone to store data, they have to prove that they're continuing to maintain a copy of that data. So that, that's called sealing. And you take that data, you run all these, you make these proof circuits, that takes a fair amount of energy. Then you actually have to store that data over time. And so those are the, the two main components. And what we realized was that by just looking at public records on the Filecoin chain, we could tell a lot about the energy use of individual nodes. So we can see how much data are you storing, how quickly are you adding more data, and we made a dashboard based on our model of just taking publicly available information from individual Filecoin nodes and letting you see, okay, how much energy is the network using, how much energy are those nodes using, and based on IP information, how is that distributed throughout the world? And so that's, that's sort of the starting point for a lot of what we do, is we can look at these, these public proofs, which we have for Filecoin, but obviously you don't have for a lot of Web2 systems, right? You're not, you're not sure exactly how much, uh, how much you know, data storage capacity is in a lot of these other, other data centers. And we're able to see, okay, what is that energy use? How is it distributed? Then the next step was, what can we do about that, right? How can we take that information that we have how can we use that to reduce the environmental impacts of the network? And we can, we can get into a lot more of that. This is you know, an evolving process. But the first thing we did was just allow nodes to buy renewable energy and prove that. So we know that this node is likely in this region uh, based on its IP information. We um, can tap into markets for renewable energy. Um, uh, that mint things called renewable energy certificates. So that's the, the right to consume a certain amount of renewable energy in that same region. And we're able to connect that to the energy use of, of Filecoin nodes. Um, so if you go to filecoin.energy, you can see all this information around how much energy is being used, where it's distributed, and where you're getting renewable energy from. So I just wanted to repeat that because I think a lot of parts of that are really super cool and it's one of the reasons that I kind of fell in love with this project, that um, the ways that we calculate the environmental, or at least the carbon, you know, impact of energy use for the Filecoin network is really truly uh, specific to the exact node in its location, the time of day, the energy use. Is that all correct? Like, yeah, yeah. Be because we have all this, all this public information again, because it's all registered on the on the blockchain, right? About what you have to do in order to store data, what you have to do to be an active node. We're able to to use that in this totally public way to to try to assess what the environmental effects are. Amazing. And I also want to give a shout out to Bryn, who uh, was helping bring me up to speed on uh, how the energy use of the Filecoin network compares to AWS the other day, which uh, really increased my knowledge. And I appreciate it. Yes. Also, apologies for messing with my phone. I'm trying to be a good steward of time. So I set a timer on there that hopefully won't uh, go off obnoxiously. Um, 
Great. So um, can you tell us a little bit about green scores and what actionable measures uh, can be taken? Yeah. So, so like I said, this is an evolving process, right? And if you look at environmental claims by any of these organizations, right? So, so Google, you know, says 100% renewable energy since 2007. Now they're moving to, um, you know, towards 24-7 renewable energy, right? There are all of these gradations of what we can do to reduce our impact. And the way that we're allowing storage providers to do that is we're saying, okay, if you are a node in the network, these are the things that you should be thinking about in order to reduce your impact, right? You should buy renewable energy if you can. You should, if you have the ability to, you can install solar panels on the roof of your facility and you can power your storage provider operation with local renewable energy. You can do things like um, immersion cooling, um, which is this amazing technology in data centers where rather than all of your IT equipment being in the air, um, where you have to use fans and air conditioning in order to, to cool it down, um, you can just immerse all of your IT equipment in a liquid that does a much, much better job pulling uh, heat off of your, your equipment and makes your data center more efficient, right? There are all these different things that you can do to reduce your environmental impact and reduce the amount of electricity you use and the carbon associated with that electricity. And different strategies are gonna make sense for different nodes, right? And really to incentivize that correctly, what we, what we realized is we really need to build ways for nodes to prove what they're doing and use that information for something that we call a green score, which you, you just asked about, um, which allows anyone who's storing data on Filecoin to say, okay, actually, I don't wanna just store data with any node. I wanna store data with a more sustainable node. I wanna store data with a node that has a higher green score. And so we built a system where you, if you run a node in the network, you can say build solar on your roof. You can then submit your power bills to a third party verifier and that verifier will look at all of your information, uh, look at your power bills, look at, in some cases, the actual timestamps of electricity generation on the inverter from your, your solar project, and say, okay, yes, during this set of months, this storage provider was powered by local renewable energy on their roof. Um, or this storage provider was more energy efficient because we can see from their power bill they didn't use that much energy. Right, and so what we realized is in addition to all of this publicly available data, we really need these Web3 native records that are verified by, by someone else and then can be associated with these minor IDs. And so what we did for a green score is we broke it down into these three different parts. We said, okay, one of the things that we need to know in order to direct people to more sustainable nodes in the network are if you take all of the emissions in that region as a, a big pie and you divide it between everyone using, using electricity, right? So the, the emissions associated with the electricity grid, um, how, what's, your, what's your emissions associated with your, your minor ID operation? That's one question. The second question, that the, the second component of a green score is what's your actual local effect on the power grid? So if you remove this minor operation, if you remove this load at this point, then what does that do to overall emissions? Which is a different question than the, the slice of the pie, right? So that's the second pillar of this green score. And then the third pillar is how good is our information about your environmental impact and about your carbon emissions? So do we only have these, these uh, publicly available records and models, which are, are really good, but don't necessarily tell the whole picture? Do we have really granular data? Do we have data from your power company? Do we have data from your solar inverter? Do we have data from your smart meter? Can we see in detail um, what your energy use profile is or not? Um, and so those are sort of the three pillars that go into a green score. And so if you do things on the Falco network, if you say store um, uh, data with a storage provider and you wanna decide who to store it with, um, you can access this information and choose to store it with a storage provider that's more sustainable. If you want to um, interact with the network in any other way, right? People are coming up with all sorts of really neat applications on top of the FVM, the Filecoin virtual machine. Um, they're gonna have access to this information to choose nodes um, that are more sustainable and get access to all that, all that um, emissions information along with just the, the other uh, records on the network. So that is extremely cool. And I feel like this would be, at this point, like a lovely like PSA about all the ways that the Filecoin network can be really green, um, which of course, we all love the Filecoin network, let's, you know, 
But I think um, one thing I'd love for you to talk about, Alan, is um, how these tools can be used for other networks. Because I think that that's one of the things that's, that's really exciting is having tooling that not just helps the Filecoin network, but uh, can really take these measures and be used by anybody. And I think that oh, I'm going to say this like three times in this fireside chat, but uh, <laughs> um, that's one of the things that is a big takeaway for me. Is there's anything that people take away from this as we'd love to evangelize people to come up afterwards, talk to Alan, talk to me, talk to Bryn, talk to, you know, talk to anyone here um, from the Filecoin team about how you can use these tools on your own network so that we can be moving towards uh, more sustainable, measurable, reproducible um, yeah, tools for sustainability in general. So, okay, that was not a question, that was a statement, but <laughs> yeah, will you no. tell us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. And I, that's, you know, like, like Megan just said, we really want to connect with, with people who are building tools and thinking about these sorts of issues to understand, you know, how, how are you thinking about sustainability in your projects? And where are you getting that data from? And how does, how does sustainability, how do carbon emissions associated with the actual infrastructure affect your design decisions in whatever you're building? What's going well? And, you know, what, what, tools would you like in order to, to improve that? Um, so, you know, maybe we'll have, have time to, to talk about that here in a bit, um, or certainly, you know, after that today. Um, so I think one of the places that we think it's really important that people design things this way is that one design, what one, um, one way of accounting for emissions is to try and calculate what your emissions are and then just match those directly to carbon offsets. And so there are projects that are carbon neutral um, in the sense that they've, they've done that exercise, right? But that's, that's really not the right way to reach carbon neutrality, right? That's not really the right way to reduce your environmental impacts. This is really well established in something called the greenhouse gas protocol, which is the, the industry standard for how you should measure your uh, carbon emissions and try to reduce them, rather than just coming up with a single number, this emissions number, and saying, how can I get that to zero? Um, it's, it's really important to do this exercise of trying to understand what are all the different pieces of what I'm doing? What are all the different pieces of infrastructure that I'm relying on? How do I look at their impacts individually and what can I do to reduce those impacts, right? And so one example of how you can how, uh, apply some of these tools directly, right, is using um, infrastructure, uh, you know, taking data on, say, the, the energy use profile of, um, of uh, you know, say, a, a data center that you store data in, um, and using that, using content addressed public records of that energy use profile in order to generate your own green score for your application, right? And we'd love to, you know, talk to people in more in more detail about that. Awesome. Uh, some other areas that Filecoin Green um, has been working on uh, in this like larger bucket of tooling beyond just measurement um, and you know uh, understanding of the carbon impact of um, of our data nodes. Uh, is sort of like a wider bucket of Web3 tools and how we can use trustless verification in novel ways um, to, you know, to work on sustainability. And so one of the things I, I would love for you to talk about um, is one is the sort of like crisis of trust that people have around carbon offsets. And I think one of the things that gives a lot of people very valid hesitation when we talk about using kind of market-based approaches uh, for sustainability uh, is because I think there's a lot of, um, you know, like a lot of people have heard the carbon offsets are not necessarily useful. Um, and could you talk about how we can use Web3 tooling to, to help with that? Yeah, definitely. So a carbon offset is based on this idea that what we're doing when we emit and what we're doing when we avoid emissions or pull carbon dioxide out of the air are just two sides of the same coin, right? You have this assumption that there's this one global atmosphere. What matters is the concentration of CO2 in that atmosphere. And so you can you know, offset emissions in one place by reducing them in some other place. There's, you know, right off the bat, it's clear that that model misses some important things, right? So there's this whole fossil fuel infrastructure to you know, produce fossil fuels, to transport them, to work with them, that 
if you just reach carbon neutrality, you still have all of that infrastructure, right? If you just pull as much CO2 out of the air in one place as you emit in some other place, but you don't do anything to actually change where we get energy from, then you still have all of this, you know, oil, oil and gas exploration, all of this fossil fuel infrastructure that's doing environmental damage but isn't accounted for because you've taken this, this you know, complex economics around energy and you've reduced it to just one number, right? So that's, that's one thing, right, is we can't, we can't get to where we need to be in terms of environmental degradation with just offsets. We need, like, a, like a, you know, we we're just talking about that, that sort of rich data set about what your environmental impacts are in order to allow you to, to focus on how you, how you reduce them, right? So in my situation, based on the resources that I have, based on the type of operation that I have, what can I do to reduce my envi environmental impact, right? Can I make my cooling infrastructure more efficient? Can I generate solar myself on my site? Should I contract with a site nearby that can generate renewable energy for me? All of these different options, right? Can I look at my own supply chain and try to get, say, hard drives or CPUs or GPUs that are made, um, you know, using a using a more uh, more efficient, less environmentally damaging supply chain? When it comes to offsets, because everyone everyone sort of in this industry does agree that offsets do play a role, right? The role that they play is once I've understood my impacts and done everything I can to reduce those environmental impacts, then that portion that I can't reduce is is something I should I should offset right if I want to I want to decrease my environmental impacts as much as possible and there's a ton of like you said you know consternation sort of in the industry right now that a lot of the carbon offsets that people thought were doing really good work actually aren't doing work that's as as great as they hoped so some of these are uh, project preventing deforestation um, all, all over the world, but especially some of them in, in South America and Africa have come under fire recently. And there's a lot of projects in what's called regenerative finance or refi that are working to fill some of those information gaps and really give people a better idea of how does this carbon offset relate to the actual facts on the ground. One example is a group called Gainforest that we work with a lot. Gainforest takes satellite data collected by the Europe Sp European Space Agency and is updated every two weeks or so. They use the geographic boundaries of a given carbon offset project to show the amount of forest cover in that region over time, right? So you can set up a, a carbon offset project and you can say, okay, what's, what's the history of deforestation in this region around my, my offset project? Is there actual deforestation happening there? Or did I just like pick some plot of land in sort of pristine wilderness that really isn't at risk of deforestation and so maybe I shouldn't get credit for protecting it when it was gonna be protected anyways. Mm -hmm. They also let you put a, set up a pot of money that goes to local people if they protect that forest, right? So you're able to endow, they call this an NF tree, endow a plot of land. And as long as that plot of land remains covered in forest, people get payouts from that, that pot of money over time. And so, you know, these are, these are ways of, of taking publicly available satellite data, connecting it to compute over data, and then connecting that directly to the crypto economics of either carbon offsets or NF trees um, in order to not just have impact, but prove that you're having that impact. And there's a ton of other examples too. There's uh, one, one great example is called the Regen Network. The Regen Network allows owners of land or communities who own land to change the way that they do things. So, so say, you know, use um, regenerative agriculture, say, in order to issue carbon offsets that work for that local community. So it's not just some, um, some you know, faceless international organization coming in and saying, this is how you need to govern your land in order to protect the environment. It gives local people the ability to choose what's right for that, that land and for them, and then get credit for switching to practices that sequester carbon or avoid re releasing carbon or remove carbon from the atmosphere. And again, those credits are issued on the chain and are fully auditable so that anyone who buys them can say, okay, what, how are the facts on the ground actually affected by me buying this carbon offset? 
um, allows you to, to have that, that transparency into the data proving that you, know, you used regenerative agriculture, you protected this land, um, or whatever else you did to issue that carbon offset. Very cool. Uh, something that we were talking about just you know before we came on stage here is um, thinking about how this like trustless verification uh, can speed up um, the, your understanding of impact, say within a supply chain, um, because you're able to look at things every step of the way. Would you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. And the this this really kind of gets to the heart of why some of the practices around sustainability and, and reporting are, are broken right now. If you imagine a supply chain that's you know, any, any length, more than one, right? Right now, every individual company in that supply chain is only reporting once a year, if they report at all, right? And so they take a bunch of information from their suppliers, they run it through this huge carbon ledger, they work with consultants to make sure that they're not releasing data that's too sensitive to their business that they don't want to release. And then they report on their emissions, right? Again, if you bring that back to a supply chain and you say, okay, every node in this supply chain is reporting once a year and every node relies on the nodes before it, you, you can see why we have a problem, right? If someone upstream changes something and it takes them months to report, then it's a year before that data releases, or that, that data affects the calculations of the next node. That then, you have to wait another year before it affects the calculations of the next node and so on, right? You can see why information about emissions, right? The information that we need in order to guide us to focus our efforts to reduce our environmental impact, if it's not timely, then it's not gonna be accurate, right? Because of this sort of sequential nature of reporting. And so, Part of what we're trying to do is build a system where you have that verifiability built into the data layer itself. So you don't need to wait a year before you release that. You're able to use a combination of public data and also publicly verifiable data to allow whoever's buying your products to, to, um, to understand what their inputs are, to understand what the embodied emissions in those products are much, much faster. And verification is really the key to that. Right? So we need to move from a system in which sustainability reporting is based on people emailing Excel spreadsheets to each other to a system in which sustainability information is based on publicly verifiable data. Awesome. So I think we have about three minutes left, is that right? Uh, and so I'm gonna pause right here. We have, we have a little bit more, but I'm gonna pause and see if there's questions, yeah. Uh, thanks. Really enjoyed it. Um, a, a couple of observations. You said that you're uh, using zero knowledge proofs. So Filecoin is. The, yeah. the Filecoin network is based yeah. on that, yeah. Which are in, in, inherently uh, very complex, and they get more complex on... It's faster than n squared. I can't remember the rate at which they get more complex. S um, so let me set aside talking about Filecoin. Um, with Bitcoin as an example, because they're not in the room, Bitcoin consumes about a, a 1% of the world's electrical energy. So does the entirety of the world's telecom and internet infrastructure. And one of those feels like it's providing economic and social value, and I don't think it's Bitcoin, at the sort of 1% level. What it, so that while I hear you talking about green offsets, the fundamental problem seems to be the complexity of decentralized infrastructures. Where's that going? Yeah, so I think and there's it's a... An, remembering, it's an N squared plus problem. Yeah, yeah, so, so I, think, I think hitting on, on zero knowledge, uh, Filecoin infrastructure, Bitcoin, and comparison to telecoms is maybe more than I can, I can address in a minute. Um, but yes, I, I mean, I think that you know, the, the number, you know, one takeaway, right, is that certainly there is an energy cost associated with decentralization, right? So it's, it's not, you know, there, there is extra energy that goes into generating those zero knowledge proofs. That's totally right. And the benefit that you get from doing that in Filecoin, right? So the, the energy use of Filecoin is, is very, very small compared to Bitcoin, for example, right? So they're not, they're not really in the same category. But that energy use is going into allowing you to prove in a permissionless way that you're actually doing what you say you're doing, right? 
And so, so that's one of the, the places that energy use goes to. And then I think um, the sort of economics of carbon offsets maybe is, is something that we could, we could talk more about offline. I'm gonna throw in a thing there, which is, I think this is the second time I'm gonna say it. The big takeaway that I would like everybody to have, the reason I was excited to do this talk is that I think that this is a crowd of people who are building a lot of really interesting technology uh, and starting from the outset of using tooling that is measuring in a really precise way uh, energy usage and the environmental impact of that energy usage uh, so that you can be thinking about sustainability as you're thinking about technology development. Um, you know, I think that helps us make better trade-offs. I think that it is more costly to do things in a decentralized way and that has both a logistical cost and an energy cost and sometimes that's worth it and sometimes that's not. Um, but the only way that you're gonna get there is by measuring it and trying to change it in a way that's very like reproducible and verifiable. Um, and that is why all of the tools that were made to do this in the Filecoin network, we'd really love for other people to be using them for other networks. Um, yeah. Cool. And thank you to the Filecoin Foundation again for all of your support for Filecoin Green and projects in the ecosystem. Absolutely. Do we have any more questions? Okay, well then I'm gonna invite everybody here to also come to the Sustainable Blockchain Summit in August. It's a totally virtual event, so no matter where you are, you don't have a good excuse. You can get there. If you go to sbs.earth, we're gonna have regenerative finance projects from all over the world uh, talking about what they're doing and what they're up to. So sbs.earth. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.